The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest coral reef and living structure. It's even visible from space. This incredibly complex ecosystem was declared a World Heritage Area back in 1981, but it's facing significant threats that may impact its future. Eric Fisher has been guiding tourists on the reef for almost 20 years. Eric, tell me, how big is the Great Barrier Reef? It covers 365,000 uh, square kilometres. It literally starts up there in the catchments. The land and the sea, they're all connected. So right now, you're on a reef called Moore Reef, which is east of Cairns. You're on the northwest corner of that, literally 54 kilometres straight from Cairns. The health of this reef is quite amazing. But the reef is challenged. The biggest challenge is climate change. Climate change is impacting the reef through cumulative disturbances, lots of disturbances in a short period of time. Climate change is the biggest threat to the reef. But there's also the crown of thorns starfish, water quality issues, marine debris, cyclones and storms. That's why investment in scientific research to protect the reef is so important. The Australian Institute of Marine Science, or AIMS, is Australia's world-class marine research organisation. Dora, welcome to AIMS. Come on through and I'll show you what we're up to. Headquartered outside Townsville, its work is vital to protecting the reef. So what we're focused on here at AIMS is providing solutions for these major challenges that our ecosystems are facing understanding how marine organisms will respond to those future conditions. So there are many pressures that are impacting our reef. Climate change is widely recognised as the biggest of all. We have scientists coming from all around the world, coming here to work on global issues. So what you can see here is the coral is actually quite brown. But that's a good thing because... That's Dr Bay's current research centres around heat-resistant coral. But firstly, What's a coral? Well, a lot of people think that corals are colourful rocks, but in fact they're really complex and fascinating animals. Corals are solar powered, they have little plants living inside their bodies and those plants provide a lot of the food that they need to grow in the clear waters that we find them in. So it's kind of like an animal, a vegetable and a mineral all wrapped up in one. What happens when the ocean temperatures heat up? Well, when ocean temperatures heat up, corals lose these algae that they rely on for food. So what we've seen in the last decade or so are an increasing number of these very warm uh, marine heat waves, we call them. So what we're doing here is we're studying how corals can become more heat tolerant. And our results from the lab are promising. It appears to us that there's a, quite an extraordinary ability to cope and adapt. The question is whether they can adapt fast enough to the rate of change that we're observing. Yeah, this is uh, the next generation of corals. So these are about a, a year old. It's about breeding the right corals in the facility, placing them out on the reef and then helping them survive that first critical year. We can protect them from being eaten. We can help them not being overgrown by algae and, and we're even looking at providing food or probiotics for them to stay healthy. <laughs> healthy coral guts. <laughs> healthy corals, uh, that's right. <laughs> Ames is the home of the National Sea Simulator. Using a collection of large seawater tanks, researchers are able to manipulate environmental factors such as light, temperature, acidity and more. The National Sea Simulator is what we affectionately call the smartest aquarium in the world. So we do spot coral spawning every year here in the National Sea Simulator. It's an event uh, that attracts uh, scientists from around the world. So tell me, are these some of the baby corals? Yeah, this is uh, the next generation of corals that we just talked about. And, and really, you can see quite clearly here, if I reach out, you can see some of these uh, very young corals here. We are able to identify more tolerant corals and we are able to breed them and produce whole families of corals that are more tolerant. But the challenge is not just breeding them, it's then settling them, allowing them to transition into the next life stage and have them grow healthily on the reef. We 
have scientists on the reef every day doing experiments, running transects in the water, counting fish, sharks, turtles and so on. Being heat resistant may help corals deal with climate change, but unfortunately, it doesn't stop corals being tasty to their natural predators, the crown of thorn starfish. Tell me a bit more about them. Why are crown of thorn starfish such a problem for the reef? Every 10 to 15 years on the barrier reef, we have a huge population explosion of these animals. And what they eat is unfortunately corals. And so the last thing the corals need with current other stress like climate change around is a sea star eating them and decimating their numbers. The only thing we can really do is to cull the starfish. There's a lot of different people helping us out on the reef. So we have the tourism operators, we've got all Crown of Thorns control boats, and we have some pontoon operators like Eric Fisher at Reef Magic, who is one of our first um, collaborators. We worked with him for nearly 10 years now. So a lot of people helping us out. Well, our reefs are for everyone, and the solution involves everyone. And so the work that we're doing here in Australia has the potential to benefit many other nations that are less able to do the work that we can do here. Tourism has operated on the Great Barrier Reef for decades. But in recent years, many tour operators have taken on additional roles, working alongside scientists on the reef. Eric Fisher from Reef Magic has been doing this type of work for years. So coral rubble stabilisation, we've been using a technique that was pioneered by the chocolate bar company Mars. They're modular structures covered in crushed limestone. We tie on coral fragments. We see incredible results. We see coral cover increase by 50% in less than 18 months. So it's not just about scientists and our work, but it's also about how we draw in the community, the industries, and most importantly, forging and building uh, relationships with traditional owners, which are the first scientists of the oceans. Science is based on observation, and traditional owners have been observing the reef for tens of thousands of years. Increasingly, scientists are collaborating with traditional owners to make use of this valuable resource. First Nations guides, like Lazarus, tell traditional stories to help tourists connect with the reef. And, uh, we have a dream time story about this reef right here, yep. um, about it being a shark. So oh, yeah. that's a little hammerhead right there. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, traditional owners, like, yeah, really is a reef in a sustainable way. So we have our uh, glass bottom boat tours taking all around the reef here. And while we're on the reef, we're talking about our, tr our traditional hunting. Uh, it makes me feel really, really proud. Uh, my culture, my backgrounds, um, sharing this with people and having them going out of the way to learn and ask me tons of questions. Eric, you're a master reef guide, not just any tour guide. What is a master reef guide? The thing about master reef guide was to create a network of storytellers. These identifiable individuals, part of a storytelling culture, it doesn't necessarily have to be a marine biologist. They can be uh, a First Nations cultural guide. They can be a skipper. Anyone can be a master reef guide in that sense. Is your ability and your passion to tell a story. You want people to be connected to the reef. How are you doing that? So lots happening today. We've got marine biologists down in the water taking people who have never been snorkeled before, getting comfortable. Also teaching them stories about the reef. We've got people who have never been underwater before, so actually trying diving for the first time. We've got glass bottom boats if you want to stay dry and get that First Nations perspective. We have our lab presentations happening today where you can interact with marine biologists and the research that's happening. But another lovely part of this pontoon is our underwater observatory. This is where you can see the fish feeding underwater. They put that little personal touch. Talking about an animal's personality, which makes that greater connection. It's so unbelievably healthy out here on Moore Reef. The diversity of corals is astounding. There are so many different species of fish. We've seen turtles and sea cucumbers. You can't help but get underwater, experience the magic, and really want to protect our reef. We all need to get out and see it. What we want to do is connect people to the reef. We do encourage you to go out to the reef, see the reef, involved with the reef. We want people to take home the most memorable experience they've had. 
I went for my first dive. That was really exciting because I'm actually a very poor swimmer and I was so nervous. Yes, definitely wanted to see everyone out here and have a look at it so we can get more people on board to protect it, definitely. Yeah, that's, that's the most pleasurable thing, taking people for the first time snorkeling in the reef. That sticks with you forever. I went two trips on the glass bottom boat and I was just amazed by the Mars stars. I'd never heard of it or anything like that. I'm really pleased I came and learnt about this. You know, it's so good to see that something positive is happening on the reef. So how good a job are we doing of protecting the Great Barrier Reef? Well, we are doing the very best we can because we want this reef to be around not just for our, the next couple of generations, but we're talking the next 50, 60,000 years and generations on the reef. We want everyone to love the reef and see the reef. So you've got federal bodies, you've got non-government organisations, you've got traditional owners, tourism operators, big industry, all trying to work together. That collaborative model based on mutually beneficial partners is the way of the future when it comes to like practicing 21st century conservation.